we're, we're too often starting uh, close to where the Democrats are starting. And then, of course, when you get a, a compromise or some kind of deal, uh, I don't even call them compromises, really, because generally speaking, they're just, uh, I mean, it's, it's BS, frankly. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're very happy to be talking with Justin Amash. He's a congressman from the 3rd District of Michigan, and he's one of the leading libertarian Republicans in Congress. Talk a little bit about uh, what is your general political philosophy? I mean, Reason Magazine, we've called you the heir apparent to the Ron Paul, um, you know, to the Ron mantle of Ron Paul. Um, you know, is that accurate? And in what ways, you know, what is your political philosophy? Well, I'm a libertarian Republican, a constitutional conservative, a classical liberal. Uh, some people call You've me. You've got more Austrians on your wall than the Von Trapp family singers. I mean, <laughs> this right. is. Um, I'm, so, I'm yeah. a big believer in the Austrian school of economics, but uh, you know, I'm an independent and a, and a moderate. Uh, many people would look at my voting record and say this is a moderate guy. Uh, he's willing to work with both sides. He's willing to do uh, what the founders intended this uh, for this country, and and not just play the political games. Mm -hmm. Uh, that has led to some friction within the Republican caucus. Uh, in uh, coming back to uh, Congress in this term, you were stripped of a couple of committee assignments. Uh, a member of the Republican Steering Committee, uh, when asked why were you and a couple of other free market oriented, uh, libertarian oriented congressmen taken off of certain committees, said, well, these guys were assholes. Um, is that an accurate assessment of why you were taking off these committees? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, if you asked my colleagues, I don't think anyone would, would use that word to describe me except a few people on the steering committee, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but look, I, I said I didn't uh, support the uh, House budget last time. I had good reasons for it. it didn't, Explain it didn't, that a little bit. What was wrong with the House budget? This is a budget that is widely praised as being fiscally responsible and it, it, it engages entitlement reform. What was wrong with the well, Republican Well, let me budget? say first that it's a, it's a huge advancement over budgets we've seen in recent years. I mean, we haven't seen anything from the Democrats in a long time. So um, I, I do applaud uh, Paul Ryan and, and the Budget Committee for putting together something that's way better than what we've seen before. But it didn't comply with um, the Budget Control Act, which was passed into law. So it was going to ignore the Budget Control Act. It tried to undo, uh, essentially, um, many of the military spending uh, reductions that were put in place under the Budget Control Act. I didn't like that. And it was still going to take about 30 years to balance. And I think we can do better than that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Republican uh, budget takes over a 10-year period. It, it moves spending from about three, $3.5 trillion to about $4.9 trillion. Why is that the best that the Republicans, you know, who run the House of Representatives, why is that the best that they can come up with? It doesn't come close to balancing the budget. It doesn't reduce spending clearly. We're, we're too often starting uh, close to where the Democrats are starting. And then, of course, when you get a, a compromise or some kind of deal, uh, I don't even call them compromises, really, because generally speaking, they're just, uh, I mean, it's, it's BS, frankly. When you talk about where your starting point is, it should be very different from what the Democrats are pushing, because the Republican Party should stand for very different things. Um, you have a budget balanced uh, uh, legislation or a piece of budget balance, uh, leg uh, balanced budget legislation in the works. Explain what that is and how it's different, uh, not only from what the Democrats are proposing, but from some what other Republicans have proposed. Well, what it does is it balances current spending with the average revenues of the previous three years. And that has a lot of nice effects that, uh, that people in both parties like. Uh, if you are looking at it from, uh, from the case where you don't want government spending to be suddenly cut during a recession, well, uh, this balanced budget amendment allows you to, to keep spending at the level of the previous three years of revenue. So if you have a sudden uh, recession, your tax revenues are low, you don't have to suddenly uh, slash uh, government programs. You can do it in a, in a more calculated way. You can think about the long run. And if you are um, worried about tax increases, well, I think it's got a good uh, defense against tax increases because you have to make the case that you want to increase taxes for the long run under my proposal because any tax increases that, you, um, that are incurred in the current year can't be used for current year spending. Over the past three years or so, and I'm probably off a bit, but we've pulled in about probably an average of about $2 trillion a year, uh, which would be equal to what we spent in Bill Clinton's last budget year, roughly. Um, but we're spending about three and a half trillion dollars. So we, you know, we're somewhere in the trillion to trillion and a half dollar deficit range. How does your bill propose to, you know, deal with that massive gap? 
Well, it, it deals with it by forcing the parties to get together and actually compromise. I mean, when you have compromise, it's got to be towards some goal. The goal is deficit reduction and, and debt reduction. The biggest areas of government are Social Security, Defense, uh, Medicare, and Medicaid. You've got to put all those things on the table and come up with a deal. The baseline defense budget is about $500 billion a year, assuming that the sequester goes through. What should it be um, if that's, you know, it's one of the biggest items in the budget? How much should that be cut? Well, I don't know uh, what the specific number should be, but I think when you look at all of our operations around the globe, if you look at the fact that we're still subsidizing Western Europe and uh, Korea and uh, many of the uh, Arab countries, um, you've got a problem here. Uh, these, these other countries don't even need to have a defense. They're relying on the United States, and we're spending about 45% of the world's budget on defense. If we drop down to 42% of the world's budget, would, would, be in, uh, would we be in danger? I don't think so. Uh, contrary to Leon Panetta, the outgoing uh, Secretary of Defense, who said that you know the sequester means that we may not be able to defend ourselves. You think that's well, just totally wrong? Well, for people who say that, did they think that we couldn't defend ourselves under George W. Bush in 2008? We're dropping yeah. back to George, George W. Bush levels of military spending toward the end of his term, so not even at the beginning. At the beginning of his term, we were somewhere around probably $300 billion. so we're much higher than that. And uh, for those who say it's devastating, they also have to say that George W. Bush's defense level was devastating. Um, talk a little bit about foreign policy, because I mean, you are a, um, you're not, what, what is either called uh, disparagingly an isolationist or in a, in a in more polite company, a non-interventionist. Non um, how, do, how do you define your foreign policy? And what's a libertarian vision of foreign policy that is not simply saying, you know, the world should just go away? Well, it's a constitutional foreign policy, and uh, you're, you're right to say it's not isolationist, because isolationist is actually what's promoted often by uh, uh, other people within the Republican Party and within the, within the Democratic Party. It's isolationist when you decide that uh, how you deal with countries that are threats, you just put sanctions on them and more sanctions and isolate them. That's isolationism. Um, I've, I've called for non-interventionism, which is uh, we don't send our troops everywhere in the world to deal with everyone else's problems. We have to defend the homeland here, and we follow a constitutional policy. So if, there's, that if there's a threat, then the, the president comes to Congress and says, here's a threat, and Congress has to pass a, uh, a, a authorization uh, for, for war, um, and then, then the president is authorized to do what, uh, do what he needs to do. But it should always go back to the people's house. The American forces that were used in Libya, that's clearly unconstitutional. Yeah, clearly unconstitutional. Should we and have now, invaded Afghanistan? I think so, yeah, at the, at the time. And it should, been, it should have been for a limited purpose to, to uh, take out uh, the terrorists who targeted us on 9-11. So should we have been out by 2002, 2003, something like that? Well, I don't, I don't know what year specifically, but I think that uh, you know, once the trail gets cold and you're not accomplishing any objectives, then you shouldn't have your troops there. Uh, I mean, if the, uh, the way to go after al-Qaeda was to have a massive army on the ground, then you'd think we would have gotten uh, their leaders a long time ago. But it took us a while, and, and we didn't even uh, get some of them in Afghanistan. It was in other parts of the world. So uh, we need to think about how we do it in, in a smart way. I think uh, we were always authorized to go after the leaders of al-Qaeda. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I don't think there was any doubt we had the authority to go after bin Laden, uh, wherever he was. But uh, you can't use this ongoing authorization to say, well, you can now uh, go to war anywhere in the world against any single person uh, who might seem like a threat. But going after somebody like bin Laden in Pakistan, say, is that, you know, does, is that legal, do you think, under the authorization uh, that sanctioned uh, in, intervening in Afghanistan? I think so, to go after uh, bin Laden, because he was a, a clear uh, uh, he was clearly in charge of the operation, and I think it was, it was legal to go after him. Um, I think there are a lot of other situations where it's more questionable. And um, if we're going after people who have nothing to do with 9-11, it's, it's clear that they, um, they were not the people organizing 9-11. Uh, whether they're terrorists or, or not, they have, uh, are, it's the president's job to come back to Congress and say, this is who we're going after and this is why, and for Congress to give the authorization. Should we have gone into Iraq? I don't think so in retrospect. I mean, I think it was uh, more questionable at the time, but I think in retrospect, no. I mean, I wasn't in Congress. I was pretty young at the time, so I don't, I don't uh, 
remember it as well as uh, someone well, who's... Well, uh, uh, talking earlier, you had said that you were 21 when 9-11 happened yeah. in 2001. Was that a formative experience for you in, in a meaningful way um, in terms of how you think about politics or America's role in the world? Well, it had a, it had a big impact on me. I mean, I, I think I cried for six days. I mean, it was, it was not a uh, small deal to me uh, when that happened. Um, it, yeah, like, like for every American, I mean, every American felt that way. And um, it got me in, more interested in politics. Um, you know, I, I don't think I, I developed some of my more um, libertarian leanings um, in, a, in a clear way where I understood what I, what I really believed until I was probably well out of college, well out of law school even. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, it did have a big impact on my life. And, and I felt like, uh, you know, this, this country is, um, is important. It's, a, it's the beacon of, of liberty for the world. Do you think that the 9-11 attacks uh, and this, you know, some people said it at the time, well, this was blowback or this was a kind of obvious reaction to the way America had conducted foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, but elsewhere for decades. Is that a legitimate reading of 9-11 or is that just off base? Well, I think you can't, uh, you know, blame everything on uh, blowback and you also um, can't have the United States say, well, we're not... Um, you know, our actions overseas don't have any impact on other people. I mean, you, you got to look at uh, look at the totality of it. And certainly there are things that we do overseas that um, incite people and get people upset. That doesn't give them any justification to come here and uh, commit terrorist attacks against innocent people. Um, but certainly we, we need to look at our foreign policy and make sure that we are not um, riling people up. What should we be doing with Syria? I mean, this seems to, you know, here's a case where we have a dictator who's a horrible horrible leader who commits atrocities on a daily basis. But should, does, you know, what does that mean to the United States at this point? Yeah, my mom's Syrian, so I, I understand the situation a little bit. I think that, uh, of course, Assad is a dictator. Um, what, what his regime is doing is horrible. Um, they're committing crimes against the people on a daily basis um, and, and war crimes against the people. Uh, but the, the fact is our national defense should be used for you know, our defense here in the United States. And I think it's, it's very dangerous if we get in the habit of uh, deciding uh, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, because as bad as Assad is, you don't know who's going to come and replace him. They may be just as bad. And suddenly you've uh, helped arm people who are then going to commit the same kind of atrocities and maybe come use it against the United States. So you have to be very careful uh, when you get involved in this stuff. And I think if there's a, a, th a clear threat to the United States, of course, then the uh, president should come to Congress and get the authorization necessary. Uh, so how does that play out in relation to Iran, which is, is certainly more of a threat? Should the U.S. be isolating Iran through trade sanctions? Should they be engaging them through open trade? Uh, how, you know, what's the best way to kind of work towards some kind of um, positive resolution, both for people in Iran as well as for the United States? I think that sanctions that are directed toward uh, preventing them from getting uh, weapons of mass destruction, I think those sanctions are, are useful and helpful, um, especially in the short run. I'm not sure you'd want to use them for 20 years. Eventually you have to say, well, they're not working. Um, if they eventually develop a weapon, you just say, well, what's the point of the sanctions? But uh, there are other sanctions that are more targeted at the people of Iran. I think uh, those are not beneficial to the United States. So you have to, you have to weigh what kind of sanctions, but yeah. Um, it's a situation you need to watch closely. And if, if I felt Iran was a, uh, a genuine threat to the United States, I'd give the president authorization to, to do what's necessary. Do you, uh, I, I assume that you think that Americans should be able to trade freely with Cuba. Yeah. Yeah, so should we be able to trade freely with Iran in the same way? I mean, subject to certain kinds of, you know, okay, not military technology or something. I think so, but it, again, it depends on what you're trading with them. I think uh, there, there should be efforts to prevent any sorts of weapons or especially uh, weapons of mass destruction from entering Iran. So you have to watch it and monitor it very carefully. But, uh, you know, trading uh, handbags and those kind of things, I don't, I don't think that's going to... <laughs> well, a, I guess that's depending not a threat on what's to the United in States. Yeah. <laughs> How is what you've just defined as a kind of libertarian policy of both engagement and, you know, and using the military when necessary, how is that at all objectionable to so many people in the Republican caucus? I mean, you hear people, you know, uh, uh, think tanks in D.C., Republican think tanks saying we need to have a certain amount of the budget always going to defense no matter what. Uh, we can never cut spending, et cetera. I mean, 
uh, is, it, is your message getting through to your colleagues? I think it actually is. If you look at some of the newer members in Congress, um, you look at Thomas Massey, mm -hmm. um, but, but many of the new members, um, they have a different perspective on this. And, and I'd say we're, um, you know, I wouldn't say that they all have a, a libertarian perspective on foreign policy, but it's, you know, you have a, a couple dozen, maybe three dozen people who lean more in that direction. I don't think you had that 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the message of just spend, spend, spend on, uh, on military spending is, um, it doesn't make sense. We have a, a huge national debt, and the biggest threat to our country is to let that national debt grow. And eventually when we have a situation when we actually need military spending, we actually need the money to go into our military to fight a major war, we won't have that money. So why, why would we burn the money now when we don't have a major threat to the United States, uh, instead of saving the money so that when we do have a major threat, we actually have it. Then we might have a defense budget that's even much bigger than it is now, but it would be justified because there's an actual threat to the United States. Uh, speaking of you know, what's growing the national debt, Medicare spending is certainly, you know, it's one of the largest items in the budget now and it's only gonna get bigger and bigger. And everybody agrees that Medicare spending more than anything else is the time bomb in, in federal spending. What should be done about Medicare? Well, you need some reform to uh, make it more like a, a private system. I mean, you need, when, when you look at it though, the, the biggest problem is the rising cost of healthcare. It's, it's not even so much that it's uh, a government operated system, it's that healthcare costs are rising. And uh, the reason healthcare costs are rising is because there's a huge disconnect between uh, what people receive and uh, what people pay because they don't know what they're paying for. They go to the doctor and they ask for uh, medication or they ask for a procedure. They don't know how much it costs. The doctor doesn't know how much it costs. I've talked to many doctors who tell me patients come in, they don't even know what to tell them when, they, when they're asked about how much something costs. That's a, that's a big problem for our and system. And Obamacare, it's, I mean, health care reform did nothing to address that basic that's, disconnect. That's not addressed at all. So you've got Medicare that will uh, rise in cost over the years because of that. You've got Obamacare that will have rising costs because it doesn't address that issue. Um, it's, it's so with Medicare, though, I mean, Paul Ryan was, uh, you know, really demagogued for supposedly, uh, you know, destroying the idea of Medicare as an open-ended entitlement and replacing it with vouchers that would allow people to buy a, a policy. Is that actually a good idea? And it's just that he set the level of the voucher too high. I mean, how, how do we restrain? Or how do we bring that information loop of what, what health care costs to people so they understand it and reduce health care? It's a better system that we have now. I don't think it ultimately addresses all of the problem, uh, problems with rising health care costs, as I said. But uh, the, the Paul Ryan suggested system would, would work much better than what we have now. And it actually makes the health care system operate a lot like congressional health care operates. I mean, it's, it's not truly a voucher system. You, you pick something from, uh, you pick your health care from congressionally uh, government approved plans and then uh, the government chips in a portion of it and you chip in a portion of it. You uh, mentioned that your mother is from Syria, your father is from Palestine. Um, uh, he moved to Michigan in the late 50s? In 56. And, yeah. um, talk a little bit about how the experience of having parents who are immigrants to America um, how does that inform your position on immigration, which has become a really, uh, you know, is, is also a front burner issue now? Well, immigration is an, is an important thing for this country. I mean, everyone at some point, uh, for the most part, uh, was an immigrant uh, who came, they came here from somewhere else. And uh, it's important to have a regular flow of immigrants. I, I think the, uh, the biggest problem we have is, is having a welfare state. Um, and this is the problem Europe has. It's, it's not so much that they have a large uh, immigrant uh, flow into the countries, it's that when you have a large welfare state, there's not as much assimilation into the culture. So uh, what's happened historically with the United States, because we haven't had as strong a welfare state as, as Europe, people come here and they assimilate, they adapt, they go to work, they become a part of the culture, and they become Americans. And, uh, and that's what you'd like to see um, going forward. So and it, do you think that has slowed down in recent years, or is it more that people are fear-mongering the idea that that is not well, happening Well, there, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think the, um, the welfare state has grown in the United States. I mean, it's not just at the federal level, but at the state level. And uh, that's a big part of it. There's also a lot of fear out there, and, and a lot of that has to do with our, our poor economy for many years. I mean, the worse the economy is, the more people uh, want to blame someone and they'll, they'll blame immigrants. 
Do you think we should um, create a pathway to citizenship quickly for illegal immigrants who are already here? Well, I think giving them some kind of legal status uh, or legal resident status would be a good idea. Um, but it, there has to be a system in place first. There's no system uh, really in place for immigrants to come here as, as a country. I mean, we don't have a good immigration system. A legal, we don't have a good legal immigration system. So you got to put that in place. And then if someone came here illegally, then they should get in the back of the line and, and come in the, the appropriate way. But uh, we're not going to have a system But does where that mean that you should they self-deport and then get online, you know, on the other side of the Mexican border, which is, I guess, what we're, we inevitably are talking about with immigration? Or, no. Well, I don't know if they self-deport. I, I would say that we're not going to have a, a system where we take, um, you know, cops door to door and round up every illegal immigrant and, and deport them. I don't think that's uh, feasible or plausible. Um, if someone is here and they commit a crime and they happen to be an illegal immigrant, of course, they can be deported. Uh, nobody, is, uh, nobody is arguing against that. Um, but we need a system in place that allows these, uh, those who have come here illegally to, to become legal. Are, is the border secure enough or do we have to you know, build a bigger wall or a tighter wall or a triple wall before we can start processing people who are here illegally? Well, it's, it's clearly not secure enough, but that doesn't mean you have to build bigger walls or, or have uh, tighter security. I think the, the, the biggest reason we have an influx is we don't have a system for people to come here legally. Uh, there are people who want to come here and they want to work for a few months and go back to their uh, home countries. And I think we should, we should make that available to people. And if you don't have a good legal immigration system, you're going to encourage illegal immigration. And that's what we have. And that's why you have so many illegal immigrants. Uh, the, the number of illegal immigrants would, would drop dramatically if you had a good legal immigration system. Um, you have, speaking of immigrants or people from foreign countries, uh, behind you you've got a wall full of Austrian economists as well as at least one Frenchman. Uh, Frederick Bastiat, you have Ludwig von Mises up there, Friedrich Hayek, uh, Karl Menger, and uh, Murray Rothbard, who was a stranger in his own country. Let's talk a little bit about your intellectual underpinnings. Uh, I mean, you went to University of Michigan as an undergrad, you went to law school there, so obviously you did not get a good education. <laughs> Um, but after, I mean, where do you, where do your interest in Austrian economists uh, or in Frederick Bastiat, the French uh, journalist and thinker, where did where did that come from, and where is it leading you? Well, it it developed after law school. Actually, I was um, I, I found that my views, although I was Republican, were different than uh, a number of conservatives in my class. Um, there weren't that many. There's probably five at my law school, but but it was different than those five. And you've said that, um, you know, one of the things you noticed that when it came to, uh, when you would talk to conservatives uh, in a legal setting, they would always be on the side of the prosecutor That's and right, you yeah. would be on the side of the defendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had a, a, a natural um, sympathy toward the defense side of, of, of things. I believe strongly in protecting people's constitutional rights and, and uh, making sure they get due process. And, um, you know, I, I spent some time thinking about uh, what it is uh, my views were, and I actually did a Google search. I went on Google and I, I searched terms that were, you know, basically my views. And uh, Do you remember and, what they were? I don't, and I don't was, sa totally. was safe search on or off? Because that could have <laughs> yeah, gone yeah, horribly I wrong. I don't remember, but uh, F.A. Hayek popped up pretty quick. I mean, he was either the, the top pick or, or somewhere along there. Had you ever encountered Hayek as an undergrad or in law school? Or? Uh, I don't believe so. And I, I studied economics mm -hmm. um, as an undergrad. And I don't remember Hayek ever being talked about. Uh, you know, you hear about Friedman from time to time. What was it about Hayek's work and then, you know, other people like Schumpeter or uh, Mises or whatever? I mean, what is it about it that you find particularly interesting and relevant and, and, and meaningful to, to your life as a legislator? Well, uh, with Hayek, I mean, it was, uh, the connection was pretty, uh, pretty clear instantly. I mean, he believed really strongly in this uh, spontaneous order that that things would come together on their own. It was sort of like a, an evolutionary process. And um, if you allow people to make decisions, they've got the knowledge because they're you know, decisions they're making are closest to them. Why should someone else make it from far away? And if you allow people to make their own decisions, you actually get good outcomes for society. And uh, that, that really is something that uh, I think about a lot as a legislator. Now, behind me, I believe, on the wall, there's also a, a picture of Ayn Rand. Talk about Rand. When did you encounter her, and, and how does she speak to your, uh, to your worldview? 
Well, I mean, Rand is, uh, uh, speaks in a sort of different way. I mean, it's, uh, it's more of an emotional appeal. And um, I don't remember when I... Uh, and I'm when sure I, she would be very <laughs> angry to hear that. I don't, I know, I, yeah. I know. It, it, yeah. But when I, you know, when I read some of her works, I, I find myself uh, connecting to a lot of the characters. I, I, I sort of uh, feel the same frustrations they feel. And, and I think that's, um, that's an important aspect of her work. Uh, um, when did know. you uh, first encounter Rand? Oh, probably not till four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. so and so, I mean, when you read a, a novel, uh, yeah. Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, uh, you find you, the frustration of being hemmed in by kind of overreaching legislators yeah. and business interests. Yeah, sure. And, and, and Rand's philosophy is very different from Hayek's. I mean, they come to many of the same conclusions about what kind of um, you know, government you should have and what kind of uh, social order you ultimately uh, would get. But, but they uh, think about it in very different ways. And I, I find that interesting. And, and uh, Bastiat's another person who um, appeals emotionally and, and is very different from Hayek, but but adds something to the to the conversation. What, yeah. What what do you uh, what's the uh, kind of spice that this Frenchman adds? To well, this, to I mean, do? it's a it's a nice French spice. I mean, yeah. it's it's uh, it's short stories, uh, almost parables about um, about uh, folly, the folly of government and and interventionism, and um, the folly of restricting free trade. And uh, I think that's uh, it's it's beautiful to read. I mean, when you read Bastiat's work. Um, people are really compelled uh, to to agree with it. I mean, it's 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 hard to refute. And I actually give away um, the law when people stop by my office. I've got copies of the law I give to people. Um, is it a hard sell in contemporary Michigan or in the industrial Midwest to say, look, guys, your your economy has been tanking here for a long time. The answer is free trade, as opposed to the answer is more protectionism. Well, it's, it's always going to be a hard sell with some people. There's no doubt about that. If you're in a particular industry that's, that's getting benefits from protectionism, then yeah, it's, it's going to be a hard sell to you. But protectionism doesn't help people. It helps the people in those companies. And those people in those companies are a small percentage of the population. So I'm, I'm concerned about the entire population in my district, the entire population of the state of Michigan and the United States. Everyone is a consumer. Only some people work in particular industries, so it doesn't make sense to have laws in place to protect particular industries and then hurt 100% of the people. Right. Um, you also have a picture of Murray Rothbard. Talk a little bit, uh, you know, Murray Rothbard is a big uh, anarcho anarcho-capitalist bomb thrower. What do you, what do you find particularly uh, compelling about his work? Well, I think he's, uh, he gives an interesting um, anarchist perspective, and I'm not there. I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I, I fall more in the Hayek camp, and I think it's important to understand his work, to understand his way of thinking, because when you have discussions uh, with those who are on the anarcho-capitalist side of things, it's important to understand where he's coming from, where they're coming from, so you can uh, make your arguments to persuade. I mean, I ultimately think there's, uh, there's got to be some government, there will be some government, um, I believe in a sort of a, a minimal government state, and you're going to have different levels of uh, different amounts of government at different levels. At the federal level, it should be uh, very small in, in how it affects your daily life, and it should just deal with things of national scope. And at closer levels, um, local government or your neighborhood association, well, it might have a huge impact on your daily life, but um, it's certainly not going to protect you from an invasion. You know, how possible is it to actually, re, you know, resize the, or, you know, to uh, shrink the size, scope, and spending of government? Well, you've got to convince people that things can be done at the local level or the state level. There are a lot of people out there who are afraid of, of government leaving. They don't want to see no government. They, they think when, when they hear a libertarian or a conservative saying we want smaller government, there's going to be no government. That's not really what uh, most of us are arguing. We're just arguing there should be um, different sizes of government in different places. And, um, if you want a large local government, then that's fine. It's up to you, and your, it's up to your local community. But the thing that's nice about it, the thing that's nice about our system of federalism, is if you've got too big a government at the local level and you don't like it, you can move to the town next door. But if the United States has too big a government and it's affecting all 100% of, of the people in the United States, 
it's very difficult to leave. What are you gonna, you're gonna go to another country? I mean, that's basically your only option. And there's no country that's actually uh, freer uh, than the United States, at least historically. We may be losing that, uh, that title. Um, you're an outspoken advocate for Second Amendment rights. Uh, talk about your worries at the, at the federal level, um, you know, of, about those rights being taken away. Well, the, the founders were very clear that they didn't want the government intruding on those rights. And you have to think about the Second Amendment in the context in which it was drafted. They had just fought an armed revolution against their own government. And a lot of people forget that. That's, the, that's where the Second Amendment came from. And they understood that uh, it was important to protect that right so that no government, no future government, could ever take away the people's right to defend themselves. And that's what the founders intended. And uh, this idea that, well, if, if you had a um, corrupt government that tried to um, attack the, the people of the United States, they couldn't uh, stand up for themselves with with small arms, I disagree with that. I think uh, people can protect themselves. And I'm not suggesting that uh, our current government or any uh, government in the future is going to uh, use any force against the United, against, uh, United States citizens or, or people who live here. Um, but the founders uh, believed that it was an important protection to have in place because they did face that situation. They actually did face the situation where their own government came against them. One of the uh, things that uh, seems to drive people crazy about libertarians is libertarians prize uh, consistency or systematic thinking. And so that, you know, the idea is that conservatives might say, well, government should be small except for defense spending, and then it can, you know, kind of uh, really run up the credit card. Um, or social issues, we should have a small government, but then when it comes to certain types of bedroom issues, uh, whether it's uh, things like abortion or reproductive rights, or gay marriage. Um, where do you come down on those issues? What, what's your, uh, should there be a federal recognition of same-sex marriages? Well, I don't think there should be a federal definition of marriage. Um, so I think the federal government should just stay out of this. Uh, really, marriage should be a private contract that has nothing to do with government. How does that play into uh, things like the tax code? Because it's clear that, you know, should we get rid of any kind of married status in filing of taxes then? Ultimately, yeah, I think so. I mean, we're not even close to, to that situation now, and it, it may be the case that uh, we're, marriage is so tied into the tax code and other benefits that uh, what will ultimately happen is that gay people will be allowed to marry under uh, you know, some kind of federalized uh, version of marriage. What about abortion? I'm pro-life. 100% pro-life. I think it's so. A, okay, what it's, do, what does that mean, though, in terms of um, should the federal government ban all abortions, or is should that be left to localities or to states, or how how do you work that through? A kind of understanding, you know, as you were talking about, of different levels of government that are, you know, uh, uh, looking at different parts of life. Well, I think, uh, you know, when you have the case of uh, abortion, you've got two people involved. You've got a you've got a baby, and you've got a, a parent. And um, I think it falls within the Equal Protection Clause of the uh, 14th Amendment. So and in, uh, current, under current federal law or constitutional readings, the state does not have an interest in, uh, in a fetus or in a pregnancy for the first trimester. You would say that that's an error. Um, how, far, you know, how far back to the moment of conception should it go? I think that's a, it's a, it's a tricky question, um, but I think that where we have it now is not correct. It should be closer to the point of conception, and whether it's instantly or the first three days, um, I think that's more sensible, and that's what uh, uh, that's what I think would be would be correct. Yeah, are you against birth control? Are you in favor of certain types of birth control, but not others? Or could well, you speak to that? Certain, I haven't thought about all the types of birth control, but I'm, I'm certainly uh, there are certain types of yeah. birth control that I would consider. Um, you know, uh, abortion causing, and there are other birth con other methods of birth control that I think would be fine. So, do you are do you think that we're getting? I mean, we're still in the kind of early stages of really controlling our reproduction in in a lot of ways. I mean, the birth oral pill only came out in about 1960. Uh, was only made legal to non-married women, unmarried women in the early 70s. Um, will as our technology of kind of controlling our bodies gets better, will abortion be less of an issue, or do you think it'll always be there? Well, I think abortion will be an issue uh, in the near future, uh, but uh, you, you might eventually get to the point where um, a baby is viable at, at a very uh, early stage and, and more people uh, 
go in, fall into the pro-life position. You're an Orthodox Christian. Um, talk a bit about how that informed your kind of upbringing and how it informs your legislative profile, if, if it does, and, and if it doesn't, why doesn't it? Well, I, there's a strong emphasis in our church on free will and on the, uh, the mystery of uh, the order of the world, and I think that really fits in well with, with my views. Um, I'm not sure that uh, you know, growing up, that, uh, that my views were necessarily shaped by that, my, my political views, um, but they definitely do mesh together very well. I, I believe strongly in the idea of free will. People can make up their own mind uh, about how they live their lives, and, uh, and they will be judged accordingly, either positively or negatively. You know, what are, what are the most important issues that America has to grapple with in, in this next two-year period, in this next congressional term? It's got to be uh, debt, and I think civil liberties as well, but uh, debt is number one. I mean, you, you have to get the debt under control because eventually it, uh, there's that clock, yes. as I mentioned. But Anytime you, you know, somebody says something about reducing debt yeah. in Congress, yeah, that bells it's, go off. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the president. Yes. He's, he's trying to stop yeah. me. So, uh, you know, we got to get our debt under control. Does that mean it's... not raising the debt limit at the end of March or, or brokering a tough deal to say, okay, you know, we will have a short-term increase, but it's got to start coming down? I, I don't think you raise the debt limit unless you get major reforms to major programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and in it, the here and now, not yes. 20 years down the yeah, road. You gotta get, yeah, you've got to get the laws changed now. And some of those mandatory programs, yeah, they, it does take a while for the, um, the, the cost savings to kick in because of the way they work, but, but you've got to make the changes immediately. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how your um, uh, votes against things like the National Defense Reauthorization Act and whatnot played out in your party and how, how you will continue to push for broader civil liberties going forward. We haven't had good uh, protection for civil liberties in either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party for many years. I mean, you have a few members but not, not that many who are that outspoken about it. Um, and I think the Republican Party is actually coming along more in the direction uh, of my way of thinking and, and of young, many young Republicans, um, that protecting civil liberties is one of the most important things our country, our, our government should do. I mean, it's really um, the reason for the founding was to protect civil liberties of Americans. So when, when you look at various issues like drones, I'm not against drones as, a, as an object. I don't object to the idea that there, that there be drones. I think drones can be a, a, a useful weapon in war, um, but any use of drones should be authorized by Congress. And it, it shouldn't be just an um, you know, open-ended um, use of force against anyone that, that the president sees as a threat without any approval from Congress. Um, the same with the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, there may be reasons to detain people, but it should be in the context of war, and it, it can't be so broad that you can actually come into, the, into a home in the United States and grab uh, an American citizen out of his home and detain him, not tell his family anything, and say, well, we think he might be associated with terrorists. That's, that's the current law, and that's frightening. That's not what our founders intended. Uh, final question. You're the uh, parent of three children. Yes. Um, what do you? What would you say the odds are from you know zero to a hundred uh, percent uh, of you know that they will that they will come of age in a uh, richer and freer America, or one that has just either gone sideways or actually gone downhill in terms of producing wealth and freedom. Well, I have to say the odds are pretty high. I, I think that there, it's still 90% odds because I, I really do believe uh, in the American people and my, you know, my dad and mom came here as immigrants. Um, they came here with nothing. There is a spirit here that is independent, that's um, a libertarian in many ways. And, and it's in uh, pretty much everyone I run into regardless of their political affiliation. So I think that is still strong. And when I go to town halls, I get a good reception. So um, I think we still can turn this thing around, but not with uh, the current Congress or the current president. And it's going to take some, some changes and some time. Well, with that, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Representative Justin Amash of the 3rd District of Michigan. Thanks for talking to Reason TV. Thanks, Nick.